Well, as I tell everybody, I like to plant a little sunshine in my garden. And that is sunshine. Mm -hmm. So I planted those in with sweet potatoes, and it just gives you a little pick-me-up when you go out there. Beautiful orange panary giant zinnias. Look how big they are. Mm -hmm. Where's yeah. one of the big ones? Right here. Show everybody Show this one. Compared to your wow. hand. My hand right there. Look how big. I'll take that. Look, look how big that bloom there is. Huge. Now these Benary Giants come in 13 different colors. I don't think we care about, we care most of them. And then they come in a mix. That's bigger than my hand. Yep. We just love growing the flowers in with our vegetables. Mm -hmm. As somebody once said, flowers love vegetables. And vegetables love flowers. And women love flowers. And women love flowers. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Rub Our Real Garden Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the radio and the internet as well. If you're new, welcome. If you're a regular and part of the Hoss family, welcome back as well. We enjoy having you. Thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking about cow peas because it's in the middle of summertime and cow peas or southern peas is the topic tonight. We're going all in on that subject, talking about different varieties, how to grow them and why you should be growing them. So stay tuned. First of all, the garden is producing like crazy. Yeah, tomatoes, tomatoes, tomatoes. Tomatoes, everything is giveth, giveth, giveth. Although the weather is hot and dry. Uh, we have shared, shared, shared. We have shared, shared, shared. You know, it's probably the hottest June I can remember the last few years, and that's gonna cause our garden to mature, to give up a little bit quicker. Normally by the 4th of July, our garden is over with, pretty much with our spring, with our spring, crops they're over with and and it's going to be that way this year if not a day or two before Every, this this heat is just tearing up our tomatoes and now it's going to rain and that hopefully it's going to rain hopefully, some yeah. but if it rains much it'll even cause more problems so we're at the point now where we're fixing to uh be cycling in some more crops and some cover crops and we're going to talk about that a little later on about what you can do but let's give a little update on the hostinator okay the Hostinator contest is going on, you guys. It is. And as of right now, because we're exempt from the Hostinator yeah. contest, but this right here. But if here, we weren't exempt, we would be winning. We would be winning. This right here weighs what? 1.95. One, almost two pounds. Mm -hmm. But Brother Ray Strickland at the moment is in the league. Is that right? Yeah. Brother, and what's his weight on his? 1.8 something. Is it? Brother Ray, which is a local guy, is in the lead right now on Hoss Nader. So y'all don't forget about the Hoss Nader contest. You win a $100 gift certificate. You can email kpowell at hosstools.com. Mm -hmm. um, or you can tag pound Hoss Nader contest mm -hmm. on Instagram. So the rules are you have to have the Hoss Nader on a pair of scales, not a pair of scales, on a scale, reading the weight with the seed pack. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Ain't that a large tomato? Gorgeous. Hostinators have performed awesome for us this year. We've had a lot of people emailing us about how great they're doing for them, and it is just wonderful that we hear those good, exciting news about the Hostinator. Mm -hmm. And this is a new variety that uh, we started this year, and uh, I was really excited about this one. Now I have to give a disclaimer. You didn't grow them. I did not grow these. Carrie, if y'all know Carrie, she's our marketing director, she grew these and brought these in. And AKA she, the Grinch. AKA the Grinch. She uh, she raves and raves about how productive these have been for her. And, they're uh, sweet. They are beautiful. Look how the yellow modeling down through there. And uh, they is a great snacking tomato. And that's one thing I said about them the first batch she brought into them. You know, a lot of times cherry tomatoes can be a little tart. So are these cherry okay? tomatoes? These are not classified as ch cherry tomatoes. They're a little bigger. No. Yeah. But these are actually sweet. They don't have that tartness. Mm -hmm. And I like a tart tomato sometimes. They're okay. But the sweetness of this kind of overrides everything else. That's good. We'll just leave it right mm -hmm. there. That is an indeterminate variety there that will give it, give it, and give it some more. Mm. Great. What else we have? What else we got? This right here, folks, is edamame. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Edamame. It is protein packed. Mm -hmm. Soybean, this is a soybean, but it's a particular type of soybean that is grown for edamame. 
And I first ate this a few years ago. Some people brought it over to the house and introduced us to it. And we grew it that year, and we haven't grown it since. But we have grown it this year, and it's packed full. Now, what you do is you pick them once they're filled out, kind of like a bean, a pea like we're going to talk about today, mm -hmm. so that you can shell them. But you boil them whole in salted water. So I did two cups of peas, six cups of water, a tablespoon of salt, mm -hmm. bring them to a boil, cook four to five minutes, drain them, cool them off, toss them with some coarse sea salt. Mm -hmm. You can keep them in the fridge up to four to five days mm -hmm. already prepared. Or you can um, prepare them just like this and freeze them. Mm -hmm. Um, and then take them out and let them thaw in your fridge as you want them. All right, so let's talk about how they yield. we probably got a 30-foot row. We've yeah, had them on a trip. Anyway, some people, like Carrie, eat the whole pod. Really? Yeah. Well, I've never known that. Yeah. I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to try that? I don't want to try that. <laughs> it's a little rough to eat the whole pod. Well, that's what she did this morning. Yeah, she's a little weird anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of bull peanuts. It Did does, it does. Um, so we got about a 30 foot roll on drip tape and ours are looking wonderful. What would you say, because these things are loaded, loaded. This was like two bushes. Two bushes right here. So we probably over planted, but we'll have plenty to there again to share. Eddie Mama, it's a great, it's a great fill in. I tell you where it works for us. Late in the spring, if you still got a spot left over to plant soybeans, soybeans don't like cool, moist. I mean, they like moist, but they don't like cool soils. So once the soil's temperature raises up and you got a spot left over, it's a good place to fill in some Eddie Mama. Yep. That's what I did, so it's worked out good. All right, you know it's hot and it's dry and it's hot and it's dry. And we always talk about struggling out in the garden this time of year. Struggling heat. I got a little shameless, shameless tip for everybody. What? This hat right here, how's my hair look? Bad. Okay. This hat right here I bought off Facebook or maybe it was TikTok. I bought it off TikTok. You know how you see these products on there that you... TikTok made you buy it. TikTok made buy it. It's these little products and these impulse buys that you made. It was 20 bucks. I didn't expect a whole lot because you really take a gamble on these things. I bought things like before and been, mm -hmm. been very disappointed. This is a winner, folks. 20 bucks. And then when I went to check out, it didn't have sizes. So one size fits all. And if y'all know me, I got a big old jug okay. head. And I was worried about it. I said, you know, it's 20 bucks. So I took a gamble on it. And I got it in. I love this hat. It fits perfectly. One size fits all. It's kind of got this elastic thing to it. So it kind of conforms, conforms to your head. Mm -hmm. And it's got these buttons on there. So you can make a bucket head out of it. Or you can clip it up. Oh, cool. And the material on there is extremely soft and comfortable. And that's not a sponsor. And it's not a sponsor. I'm just telling everybody that, you know, What's you may the name of mission. It? Now, mission. one thing I don't like about it is they put their name right there in the front. I wish that wasn't there. But they do brand their, their hat right there, and it's mission. I'd much rather it say Hoss or nothing. But it does say mission there. Well, so, you need to get some Hoss hats on. So be it. It's very comfortable. 20 bucks, folks. If you can find them, they're all over social media, Facebook and TikTok. I love it. Little tip for you there, non-sponsored. I don't like a penny off that. Just thought I would share it to you. Every now and then you find those rare jewel gems out there and you just want to share with everybody. There you go, your mission sun hat. All right. All right. So let's talk about peas, because that is the subject of tonight. Peas. Peas, peas, peas. What is a pea, Sheila? What's a cow pea? What's a What's the difference pea? in southern pea, cow pea, field pea? Nothing. Nothing. So here in the South, if you mention peas, we're going to have peas for supper. We take that as field peas or cow peas. If we're going to have peas that you guys up North grow English as English peas. peas, we say, okay, we're going to have English peas for supper. Or garden peas. Garden peas or English peas means the pea that you grow up North. Mm -hmm. Southern peas down here is just a pea for us. Peas. We have peas tonight for supper. So you guys up north, you're going to have to understand that when we talk to you. If we talk about peas, we're having southern peas. If we're having English peas, the garden peas, we're having those English peas. It's just the way it is here in the south. Another thing is what we have found since we've been in the seed business is every area, geographic area there, 
has a particular pea that they like the best and they normally call it some other name that's not the right name for it. There's a lot of confusion with peas, cow peas out there. Well, my mama grown so-and-so pea. Well, it actually wasn't that, it was another variety. A little funny story there, probably about five or six years ago, your mother and stepdad gave us a pea that they, somebody had gave them, it was an heirloom pea. Nobody knew what it was. We'd and never heard of it. We'd never heard of it. It was a maroon type pea. And they went on and on and on about how great it was and how productive it was. So they gave us some and we grew some because they saved the seeds. We grew some for a couple of years and they were good. Mm -hmm. But it was a maroon type pea. It was different than we'd ever seen before. So I gave some to a friend of mine. He grew them. He loved them. He ended up calling them key peas. <laughs> so they got their own name. We'll come to find out. After we got in seed and started doing some research, it was a common variety called Red Ripper. Who knew? Mm -hmm. You know, you thought you got this heirloom variety, but it actually is not an heirloom you variety. You named you a pea. I thought I named me a pea. It's, it was a common pea out there called Red Ripper. Once we found that out, then we started carrying the Red Ripper pea that we carry today. Now, Red Ripper pea is known primarily as a foraging type pea, although you can't eat it. It's a good pea. It's not probably our favorite one, mm -hmm. but it is a good one. What's your favorite? My pa favorite is probably pink eyes. I think I like zippers. Really? Mm -hmm. I like the white, like the cream 40, the yep. white. Yep, yep. So, a lot of times there's, there's this misinformation about it there. I've even had to uh, pull up the University of Mississippi, Mississippi State website. They have some pretty good information on there and show a customer they were wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't do it to just prove they was wrong, but I was trying to give them factual information on what they was calling a particular pea was not that type I like of pea. I'm going to have to move this that way. Hey, knackish, ain't All right, so what we're going to do on our English peas, no, excuse me, English peas, on our <laughs> field peas, is we're going to plant a crop this fall, and we're going to plant zippers. Mm -hmm. And we're going to plant them probably about the end of July. And, uh, and we'll tell you the reason why we're going to plant them in July in just a minute. So history lesson mm -hmm. here. Where'd peas come from? Peas came from Africa, as a lot of different uh, of our vegetables originated from. And they were used mainly as a herb? Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, they ate the leaves. Mm -hmm. And then the actual peas, well, I guess all of it, the bush was... Um, feed for the animals. Yeah, now that I can get that because deer, goats love peas, cows love peas, and they're full of protein as well. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, how did they eat the leaves? I didn't know the leaves were edible. It's so prepared as a pot herb. I'm hmm. not sure. I didn't hmm. go that far into it's it. It's kind of weird. Yeah, so uh, as far as I can remember, peas have been a staple here in the South. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to blanch them and freeze them, and we still do some, but we've got to the point last few years, we like to put them in jars yeah. and a jar them. One of my neighbor friends that um, I've been mentoring mm -hmm. on pressure canning, she actually canned some this week. Mm -hmm. We prefer canning over freezing because we learned during the hurricane a couple of years ago, canned vegetables don't spoil when the power goes out. For and, 10 days. Mm -hmm. So, we try to can everything we as possible instead of freezing. So it can be used as fodder. It can be used as immature little green snaps. Mm -hmm. Mature, freeze, shell, and dry. Mm -hmm. Now we don't dry our peas, although we're doing an experiment this year with tapasio bean. And we're gonna shell those out as peas and we're gonna dry those. Never before have we ever dried a pea. Here in the south where we live, we grow them in the green and we shell them out in the green and we use those peas. Now, yeah. if you got one that's immature that you pick, snap it. you just snap it and put it in there. That's the way we've always done it. And there again, we freeze it or can it. Mm -hmm. Put it in soup. Yep. They're heat tolerant, drought resistant. And they're legumes, so they can be used as a soil builder, as a cover crop as well, mm -hmm. which is good. Yep. Peas are a, go back in history, is just a vital part of here in the South. And it's one of those things that uh, not everybody grows because it's a little, little labor intensive when you start to put them up as far as picking them and shelling them, that kind of Ooh, thing. I bought some last week. Mm -hmm. 48 bucks for a bushel. Mm -hmm. But they were already shelled. 
They were already shelled. I had to wash them, and they were stung up really bad. Stung up? Stung up. What does stung up mean? <laughs> what does stung up? So the pea has a little spot on it where a little insect has stung it. Therefore, rendering it useless. Yeah, you ate some of them anyway. Well, we shouldn't have because what happens is that cow pea, cucurio, stings that pea and lays an egg inside it. So what you're eating there is a little legless white grub, a white worm there. A little extra Bet protein. Bet you didn't know that. <laughs> so, if you do share your peas out and you leave a few of those stung ones in there, you get some grubs in there. It's free. I particularly don't want grubs in my peas, but it's what happens. It happens. Okay. So you go to the grocery store and you buy peas in the grocery store. Not the ones you bought, because you bought those from a farmer. But you go buy what you think are fresh peas in the grocery store, in the producers. Mm -hmm. This is the way they do this. You're going to find this in line right here. They don't go out there and pick them, hand pick them in green stage. Mm -hmm. They let them mature on the vine, past, a little past the green stage where you would pick them. They go in there with a sprayer, and they spray them with a chemical called chromoxone. That chromoxone kills that plant overnight. The next day, it's just dead. They let it sit out there in the dry sun for a few days, three or four days, however long it takes for those peas to dry up in the pot. They go out there with a combine and they combine them. They take those peas that are now dry back to the plant and they have, uh, they reconstitute them, soak them back in water to put the water back in them and then they package them up and sell them as fresh peas. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yep. So that's what fresh peas in the grocery store looks like. You know, from a labor standpoint, it's a lot better, but I really don't want my peas sprayed with no. rocks on and then re- Constituted. Yeah. yeah put back okay. up. So that's one reason you may want to think about growing your own peas there. So uh, when to grow. When to grow. Okay. Now I'm going to give you some parameters here. This, you can have a little bit more time than this, but I'm giving you some safe dates here. And the reason I say safe dates is we don't ever know when our frost date is going to hit us in the fall. Our average frost date here is November 22nd. It could be a month and a half later, or it could be a couple of weeks before. Last year it wasn't until December. I know. We at least people pepper here all the way through December. So I'm giving you what we call insurance dates here. You guys in zone seven, you want to plant your fall cow peas July 1st to July 30th. Now, don't get, don't get mad at me. You could plant them a day or two after July 30th and probably be okay. But I'm trying to give you some insurance days there. You want to mature and you want to get both pickings, maybe three pickings off of them before that frost hits. So that gives you enough time for them to completely mature and get all the pickings off of them before we have that frost. You guys in zone eight, which is where we at, July 15th through August 15th is the ideal time to plant them. There again, you got a few days after that, you may can sneak in. Zone nine, sometime in August. The month of August is pretty much what you want to plant in on those right there. And here's how we come about those dates. Let's just take us here in zone eight. November 22nd is our, is our first frost. Yeah, in the fall. It's our first frost date in the fall. Let's take zippers first. Zippers has got a 65 days to maturity. That's from the time the seed goes into the ground because we're going to direct seed these peas here. So if we plant at the 1st of August, that's going to give us August, September, and they're going to be matured out in the first week in October. That gives us the month of October to harvest them. And then we start going into November. We're through with our peas and we don't have to worry about them getting killed by the frost. That is a surefire date to go on right there. You want to feel a little risky, you can play with that date a little bit, but that's general guidelines on what you should go on right there. Most of these peas are going to be in the range of 65 to 70 days to maturity. Method of seeding, uh, we direct seed hours. I've use never known. Yeah, you use cedar that's wonderful on peas. I've never known anybody transplant peas, mm -hmm. southern peas. 30 to 36 inch row spacing. I prefer 36 inch because some of these varieties can get kind of viney. There is a such thing as a bush type or a determinate and indeterminate type piece. Some of them run more, some of them are more compact than others. 36 inch row spacing is ideal for me. Your varieties that do like to run, such as your red ripper, your indeterminate varieties, plant them six to 10 inches in the row space. Your varieties that are really more tighter, such as your top pick, I like the top pick. They're top easy pick, to pick, pink eye right here. 
you want to plant those a little closer, anywhere from, I'd say, two to six inches. Ah, uh, two inches is probably a little too close. Let's go four to six to eight inches is what I would plant those right there. They make it a lot more compact plant. Um, fertilizer. Fertilizer peas are a legume, and they take very little, very little fertility. Now, one thing is they love sandy soils and they love poor soils. pH between 5.5 and 6.5, around 6.0 is ideal. On fertilizer, one of the pages I read on the breeder for the zippers, where we get our zippers from, said don't even use any fertilizer. Hmm. Another site that I read said use 27 pounds of N per acre and 40 pounds of potassium per acre. So that's basically one pound of K potassium per thousand square feet and like a three quarter of a pound units of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which isn't much y'all. So I think this right here is the ideal product to put at planting time right here. Cause this is a pretty low analysis fertilizer there. And this would be a good one here to start with. You wouldn't want to put much of it, but put this in when you plant your peas in the fur. And I think that's all you would need. Cause this organic fertilizer breaks down over a period of time, has a longer chain of breakdown. There. So I would recommend that one right there. I wouldn't recommend hitting it with 20, 20, 20 very much. Just, you're going to have more vine in your peas. And that's what happens if you over fertilize is you're going to have more vine and not enough peas. So you definitely don't want to do that. Alrighty. Now let's talk about the different types because this is very interesting right here. And this may take a minute, folks. All right. Top pick pink eye. This is my favorite one for a couple of different reasons. It is a kind of a compact plant. But as the name implies, it grows on the top of the plant. Like easy a, to pick. Easy to pick. I can read these things about three years ago. They did wonderful for us. It's a good piece. It's easy to shell. But the main thing is, I like the growth habit of the plant. Let's open it up and see what it's like. And when you cook it, it makes a clear broth. So this is a green type pea. When you cook it, now they're brown. The seeds are brown. It cooks up a green... Top. So they call it pink eye? So you sure it's green? Well, it's greenish. I'm not talking about the eye, but it's kind of greenish. I don't look for the... No, it has a clear broth. The I know that before. Yep, it has a clear broth. That's one of the attributes of that right there, is the clear broth. Okay. But this is a good one right there. That's probably my favorite. Although I'm not going to this year. That's my favorite because we got to grow my own horses later this year. <laughs> All right, let's talk about white acre. This is a very popular, now this is a little green pea right yeah, here. Like this is a very- They're hard to shell. They are hard to shell. That's the reason you probably would want to uh, invest in your sheller maybe if you just want to do these. A lot of people like these little small peas. I don't, I mean, I like to eat them. I, I don't know that I'm gonna roll my whole lot. Man, they're so small. Look how small they Ooh. are right there. Hard to shell. But a lot of people you love them. You shelled a lot of them? I, <laughs> a lot of them. I do the growing, she does the picking and the shelling. It's kind of a real deal. But white acre peas, you'll hear a lot of people talking about those, and they are family favorites everywhere. And here's one, Sedandy. You hear a lot of people talk about Sedandy pea right there. Now, I think that's the kind I bought last week. Probably is. Let's open it up. Sedandy pea is a small pea as well. Look there. Mm-hmm. A lot of people like those. You hear a lot of folks saying sedantes, and that's what that is right there. There again, kind of hard shell. I can get them all back in there. Boom, boom, boom. Now, we're not showing you all the peas. We're just showing you a representation. Because we're going to show you all the peas. We've been here all night. California Black Eyed Peas. This is the most popular pea right here. As far as the dry pea that I know of. This is what everybody buys at New Year's to cook on New Year's Day. The cornbread. And I, we've never grown black eyes, have we? Mm -hmm. But if you're just going to grow black eyes, they will use more of a dry pea than they are any other way. Oh, these are green. Now, these are treated. But there you have it right there. That's about the size pea that you got right there. All right. Let's move right along. Dixie Leaf. Now we're going to get into something that you guys are probably going to be a little familiar with. Dixie Lee is a Crowder type pea. Crowders can be dark, which most of them are. And I always thought Crowders was all dark. They're not. 
see how that looks right there that is a medium-sized pea but is it the shape of the pea that dictates whether it's a crowder or not that is a crowder type pea right there some people argue the fact that all crowders are dark but they're not crowders get their name from they crowd the hull so they need them to pack fill out they pack they pack in the hulls good and they, they shell out fairly easy but they are the size and the shape of the pea right there dictates whether it is a crowd or type or not. Now these cook up dark and the broth in them also cooks up dark. A lot of times if you ever know you go into restaurants, you'll get these type dark type mm -hmm. peas in the restaurants. Now we don't we don't we've never grown a dark type pea besides the red ripper and it's more of a it's not a dark it's not a crowder type it's more of a maroon color. Lady creams Lady cream, cream type. Texas cream. We may have a Texas cream. I'm not sure. Cream 40. Cream 40. All these are these small type. These are trees also. See how small they are? This is one of the smaller peas. Some of these peas are treated and some are not as according to, to what we can get. Some of you people want them treated, some of you don't. But we have to get what we can get sometimes. If they're treated, it'll say it on the website. Yeah, and some of these, we have to get what we can get. It ain't like we have a choice. We may can only get it if we get it treated. Or it does. We had a lady the other day leave us a one-star review on our website because she got a treated seed. It said treated on the description, and she bought it anyway and got it and was discouraged. But you know what? I started to respond to her, and I said I'm not. She gave us a one-star review. And she gave a long explanation there, and she said that she was giving us a one-star review because she bought treated seed. <laughs> but she went back and looked on the website, and it said treated seed. But she was so concerned, she didn't want to put them in the trash because she was scared it was going to contaminate the trash. What are they treated with? Thyram. Th thyram. Yeah, so we're not, we don't sell anything that's treated with the metoclopram. Thyram is a... a fungicide that's not very toxic at all and it keeps them from dampening off so it helps them get that good start there now i'm not telling you if you're against buying treated seed i'm not here sitting here trying to convince you of that but thyram is not that dangerous she was also she threw away other seeds that she bought that came in the pack with the treated seed but she was scared they may have jumped out of the pack <laughs> and contaminated her other seed yeah. So she was of that persuasion. Now, I didn't try to convince her any different, but she did go back and say that she bought seeds that were treated and it says on the website. So, and, and it says on the pack. And it says on the pack. So I didn't. I said, let, let it lay. White Dixie Butter Pea. Now, this is a bigger one right here. Hence the name Butter Pea. These are a little bit oh, bigger. Yep. Like little, little, butter uh, little butter beans right here. Now these are fairly easy to shell there, and that's kind of a white bean. These again are treated. So I like those. We should grow these sometime. I don't think I'm Yeah, I bought these. those last year. Did you? And put up, yeah. Hmm. I think I put them in my soup last year. Yep. That would be a fun one to grow right there. Texas Cream 40. I like them too. Yep, this is good ones. Those are easy to shell. Are they? Mm -hmm. Smaller pea, I'd say that's a mid-sized pea, well, maybe a little bit on the smaller side. White pea there, and you can tell the eye there, if you can see them, I hope you're not, doesn't have any really distinct it's color to it. Inconspicuous. Inconspicuous. Everybody has their different peas that they love, so put in your so comments below. So these are called below. southern peas, but they can grow them in the north. Yeah, I mean, they do love the heat. But if you got 65, 70 days of heat, yeah, you can grow them. Put in your comments below your favorite variety. If there's a variety in your area that is uh, grown a lot, tell us about it. All right, we save the best for last. The most popular pea that we sell, we sell more of these seeds than we do any other mm -hmm. seed, is zipper seeds. And this is what we're growing this fall right here. Now these are treated as well, but you can tell that's a bigger type pea. Now it it's like being a named, rounder pea. yeah, rounder type pea. Although it is considered a crowder type pea, did you know that? Mm -hmm. And that's due to the shape it is. Uh, kind of a whitish pea there. The name zipper means it's easy to shell. They zip, and we love oh. easy to shell because I may end up hitting just a little bit. Mm. 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 Tight. Some things we do at night time when we sit there and watch TV so we get some big bowl of peas and we shell them out. Yep. We. <laughs> we. All right, let's talk about growing peas. Let's talk about the problems you may have. 
Now there is some issues with disease such as some soil borne eat, diseases such as blight, things like that. You can simply take care of that by rotation. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna rotate and I'm gonna come behind my sweet corn and plant my peas. Perfect rotation strategy right there. So I'll have all those nutrients left from the sweet corn that I'm gonna be able to use with my pea rotation. I've already got my drip tape down. I'm not gonna use my, move my drip tape. I'm gonna use the same system. Plant my zippers right back in the same spot where my sweet corn is. So you still got the stalks in the ground? I cut the stalks off right when it was green with a machete and they have rotted down and now I'm in good shape right there. So I'm gonna plant directly right back there where my corn was at. Perfect. I may have to hand plant a few of them, but that's what I'm gonna do if I can't get my cedar run on top of those corn stalks. But that's gonna be an ideal place to put them. So if you got a spot that's coming off rotation, right now is the ideal time you can plant so the cow peas and have you a good fall harvest. Getting back to the subject at hand, diseases. A couple of the foliar diseases we have trouble with with cow peas is powdery mildew and rust. Rust. Rust is probably our biggest issue here in the south. Now we got a product here that works wonderful on rust, so this is going to be my go-to right here for spraying for powdery mildew. Now I don't have a lot of problem with downy mildew. We have more problem with powdery mildew on peas, but we're going to spray with Fungamax, and we're going to put about three applications of Fungamax on there to help with that rust. Now the next thing, going back to that, let's talk about the soil-borne diseases just a minute. Soil-borne diseases such as blight and uh, and those kind of issues, rotation, put them back behind something like sweet corn. Don't plant them in a low area, they don't let wet feet. Plant them in a higher dry area and I think you'll be fine with good rotation. You can manage some of those uh, root diseases. Insects. Mm -hmm. All right, insects is probably the most problematic pest for southern cow peas. Southern pea cucurio is what stings those cur Curio is what stings the pod and leaves that larva inside there and it can cause be frustrate frustrating at best. For some reason, they seem to be worse in the spring than they did the fall. I know this is counterintuitive to most of the time what we hear about insect pressure, but they cycle out and we don't have near the pressure with them in the fall as we do the spring. Right. Hence the reason we're going to plant a fall crop. So for control of that, you can do these two things right here. You can start with your neem oil, and that's fine, because that's going to help control aphids as well. We have a little bit of problem with aphids, but not a lot, but you can clean aphids up real quick with neem oil. Now, we normally don't have an army worm problem, but if you do have an army worm problem, you can go with BT or Bug Buster 2. The good thing about Bug Buster 2 is going to take care of the southern pea cucurio. When the pea starts blooming, you want to switch over to the Bug Buster 2 at that point, and you want to stay on a very tight, tight spray schedule with this right here to keep that pea pod from getting stung. Three to five days, I read some information where five days would do it, three applications, but you want to stay really tight there according to how much pressure you got. We have a lot of pressure down here, so we're going to use this early on, and if we have just want to wipe out aphids, this neem oil will do. But if we get on into bloom, then we're gonna switch over and use this Bug Buster too to keep our peas clean. Do have some problems with root knot nematodes. There again, rotation will help just a little bit with that too. So rotation and a good tight schedule, plant at the right time. Don't worry a lot about fertilization. I am gonna put them on drip tape. I will tell you this right here though. Southern cow peas do extremely well in hot and dry weather. If you was going to plant something to try to produce without irrigation, it would be southern peas. They love it hot and, and, they, and they tolerate it dry. We're going to put ours on drip simply because we have it there. I would put down drip anyway, but they will tolerate way more dry weather than anything else in that type family that I know of. So, all right, did we cover everything? I think, I think we so. did. Yep. All right. Halsonator contest, we talked about that. Garden photos. Garden photos. So we want your garden photos. Um, if you go to our website, there's a little drop down menu on the Hulse University tab. Submit your photos and we're going to highlight them in an upcoming video. Mm -hmm. And we got an old goat drawing. Folks, here on the set somewhere is hidden an old goat figurine. Fig figurine. That old goat is uh, is here. You may have to hunt for it, but uh, 
if you find it and send us an email in customerserve.com. Okay. Customerserve. Just at, comment in this video. Oh, com I messed it up. Comment in this video and we'll put your name in for a draw. If we draw your name, you get a coveted horse merchandise there. So here comes the draw. And Tammy McGuire. Tammy McGuire there, Tammy. Now you can send us your shipping, shipping. information to CussServe at hostools.com and we'll get you a coveted prize sent out to you. Thank you, Tammy. That's it. You don't have no corny joke? No, I didn't get No that. corny joke this week? You were supposed to get the corny joke. Everybody's gonna miss the corny joke. We need some corny joke. We need some corny joke. We need, sure. we need some help. Yeah, material. All right, folks, thank you for joining. Now it's time for you to get off that couch and get out there and do something.